1992. And the first item on the agenda this evening is the roll call by the town clerk. Chairman Creelman? Here. Councilor Amaro? Here. Councilor Cogsall? Councilor Chapel? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McLaughlin? Here. And Councilor Pearson? Here. Thank you. Would you all join me now for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next item on the agenda are the minutes of meeting number 13 held on March 9th, 1992. What are your wishes? Mr. Chairman, I move that they accept this permit. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussions or corrections to the minutes? All those in favor of their acceptance? Vote is 6-0. Thank you. At this time, we have an opportunity to ask for citizen input on items that are not formally on our agenda this evening. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to come forward and speak to a particular issue? Would anyone just like to speak? Okay, seeing no interest, we will end this portion of the agenda this evening. Now I would like to ask if there are any particular reports and or correspondence that uh, has been received since our last meeting. Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to make the public aware we <coughs> spoke at our last meeting of a public hearing about the Portland Water District rate structure and there were five counselors from Cape Elizabeth who attended and spoke at that public hearing in Portland and we're hoping to have some final results coming down at the end of this month I believe and I I just think the counselors on in Cape Elizabeth have done a very good job representing the constituents and hopefully we will have some success in getting a turnaround to some extent of the water rate situation. I also was in attendance on March 18th, the Executive Committee of uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments. At that time we had the P a Portland Deputy Police Chief, Steve Roberts, who's with the Bureau of Investigations, do a presentation. Um, our own Police Chief, David Pickering, was at that meeting as well. Um, very educational, I found. They were talking about privatization of police services and talking about regionalization, two issues which have been come near and dear to this council's heart lately. Very informative. This, council, this town has been very well represented at the COG meetings lately where we've had presentations that would affect different department heads and we've had our assessor, our public works director, our general assistance administrator and our police chief attend the appropriate meetings. And I've been very grateful for them being there and just want people to know that they have made that extra effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other uh, reports or correspondence that might have floated <coughs> in over the last month? Yes, Councilor McLaughlin. Just one more, I'm sorry. The next executive meeting of Greater Portland Council of Governments is on Wednesday, I believe it is April 22nd. There, and that will be a meeting featuring <coughs> discussion of labor contract negotiations. I invite any of my counselors to attend that with me. That is um, a topic that I asked for discussion on at COG. We are having Roger Kelly from Drummond Woodson and Ernie Canelli from Teamsters Union in South Portland speak. I think it would be a good opportunity for counselors or anybody from the public who wants to come and hear about labor negotiations. That's something we will find ourselves in again next year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? 
All right, seeing none, <coughs> we shall begin our formal item agenda. The first item this evening is item 144, to consider a, a report from the Finance Committee regarding the fiscal year 1993 general fund budget and take any necessary action. At this time, I will defer to the Chair of the Finance Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Are these working? Uh, is the sound all set tonight? Are you think they're working? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Strange noises. Mr. Chairman, in order to prompt some discussion on the budget, I would like to present a draft motion that it be ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council acknowledge receipt of the Finance Committee report and set for public hearing on Monday, May 11, 1992 at 7.30 p.m. at Town Hall the proposed fiscal year 1993 general fund budget with expenditures of $14,092,929, revenues of $4,126,096, and $9,966,833 net to taxation. This represents a valuation of $580 million with a tax, proposed tax rate of 58 cents, which is just under 3.5% increase. As I said, I put that forward for discussion purposes, and then we can talk about a memo that I distributed to the council <coughs> this evening. Okay, well, <coughs> we have a motion on the table. Uh, do we have a second on this motion? I'll second the motion. Do we have any discussion on the motion and the second at this particular time? Councillor Jordan. Any discussion regarding the right thought of the last workshop meeting that we have this budget down to 3% three, three and uh, now as I understand it, it's 3.5%. And uh, I guess when we were working the numbers, it didn't come out the same as it did the last time we had a workshop on it. That's right. The valuation has changed, and along with that, I personally <coughs> am not sure of where some of the line items stand right now. With, if I may, Mr. Chairman, can I uh, with that, then do we have time enough to have another workshop and get this squared away and get the numbers in the end and be able to send it to a public hearing? Because I'm not in favor of this, and I'll, I'll say that up front, that there's some other numbers here that I read the memo that I got, but... Uh, I didn't understand the background of it. The, Do we have time enough? Let me uh, try to explain the uh, circumstances as I think I understand them. <clears throat> the intent this evening in an effort to set this, uh, these three numbers that Councillor McLaughlin has just um, read to us is an effort to set the public hearing so that we could have it on our uh, May 11th agenda. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the final budget would be a 3.49 percent tax increase. What it would mean is that the final budget could not be higher than that particular sum. That's all it would mean. And by being able to set it to public hearing this evening, we avoid the time squeeze of having to have having another meeting and then getting the appropriate notices in the newspaper to satisfy the law so that it doesn't mean we're actually okaying the budget councillor jordan this evening 
but it means that the budget cannot be any higher than the first number that Councilor McLaughlin read. Is that how you understand it, Councilor McLaughlin? Yes, sir, it is. Um, I did distribute a memo to the Council this evening saying that I would intend to table this and not set it to public hearing tonight. And then looking at the potential schedule for workshop dates, if we did table it, we do not, I've been informed we would not have time to get the required legal notice into the newspaper, which is why I would recommend that we set it at this amount for public hearing purposes, continue to hold a workshop so we get things squared away and straightened out so we have a better understanding of the budget items, and then come back for public hearing, at which time we will take public input, we may change some things in the budget because of public input, and we may by then have changed some of the figures downward, if anything, because of the re results of our workshop on it. Okay, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I understand that, and I understand all that. I just want to know that uh, we're going to have a workshop and really go over this budget and straighten out these differences that, that has taken place between now and the last workshop that I was in. That's all I want. Yes, that's, that's my understanding. And also, again, just for the public, <clears throat> that the public would know that whatever happens in our continued deliberations on this issue, the overall tax increase for fiscal year 1993 would not be higher than 3.49%. That would be an absolute maximum increase over last year's 1992 uh, fiscal year tax uh, rate. Councilor McLaughlin. Nothing is absolute <laughs> uh, unless we decided after a public hearing to go back and raise it. But if we set it at public, we could raise it, but we'd have to go to a second public hearing. That's right. That's okay. correct. You, you I don't are correct anticipate that. that happening, but just so if by some quirk that happens, people would understand. That's right. Never say never, never say absolute. Right. I stand corrected. It's okay with me because I think you all understand where I come from because I was looking for a zero increase, and I don't mind to admit it right now. But uh, I may have to cave in at 3% or something like that. And uh, I'm going to stick to it until we can get it worked down to there if we can. I'll tell you right up front right now, I'll be voting against it. Okay, so the vote right now, there is a motion, there is a second. Uh, this is not a vote for this tax uh, rate. It is simply a vote to set these numbers to public hearing. Is there further discussion on this motion? Councilor Ramro. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd prefer to see the numbers go out, uh, which would reflect a 3% increase, because I think we could do that and maintain the budget that's being uh, presented before us tonight. Uh, but I would be willing to, to go along with the motion, with, but would want everyone to understand that I would plan to work as Councilor Jordan is planning to do to uh, have a budget increase of no more than a uh, slight 3%. Mm -hmm. okay. Heard from and would really encourage people to come to the public hearing to, to see how they feel. <coughs> Thank you very much. Other, other input on this uh, motion at the moment? Uh, <clears throat> perhaps it's a little bit out of order, but I'm certainly willing to open up this item at this moment uh, to the public if anyone would care to come to the podium and um, have anything to say on this item at the moment. It is open to the public. Uh, Rosemary, please come down. <coughs> Good evening, members of the Town Council. I was just wondering... Um, just for the benefit of those who don't know you, could Rosemary you... Rosemary Reed, 197 Ocean House Road. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you could um, please review um, what the difference is between the 3 and the 
3.5%. I'm very sorry I didn't see your workshop. I saw the first one and the second one, but I guess I didn't see the third one. And it also, does that, have, <laughs> does that have any impact on either community services or the school board? I can answer the latter part. It does not have any impact on community services, nor the school board, uh, nor the school budget, me, school budget, nor the county component uh, of the budget. Um, there, are, uh, there are three m major areas um, that we are still trying to look at, uh, and I will defer the specifics to uh, Councilor McLaughlin as I'm sure she is oh, very prepared okay, to, sure. <laughs> to go over those three areas. <laughs> the major change, one of the major changes is a, an increase in our valuation. The impact of that, regardless of what budget we come up with, was to lower the numbers that we were looking at that would have to um, come from property taxes in the town. There would be, if we go with a 3.49, 3 3.5% 3 budget, there would appear to be a change in the line for schools, but that change is only because of the increased valuation. Therefore, the school numbers would go down to $12.39 um, for the rate for schools, which is an 11 cent increase in a 0.89% increase, 11 cent increase on the schools. It would be a 51 cent, <coughs> excuse me, increase on the town line, bringing that to $4.06, bringing the total to $17.18 for a 3.49 percent tax rate, a 58 cent increase. If we are to achieve a 3 percent tax increase, we are looking again at the same valuation, $580 million. That would be 43 cents more on the town line, 11 cents again on the school line. So if there were a reduction to go from 3.49 to 3.0, the reduction would come out of the municipal lines of the budget. And that would be a tax rate of $17.10 or a 50 cent increase over the current year. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, let me just ask if there are any others who would like to <coughs> get any clarification on the uh, <coughs> budget in the context of, dis of our discussion. Okay, I, I thank you very much and I will bring it back to councillors. Please, uh, Councillor Amaral. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say <coughs> to the public's uh, understanding of where we are with the budget that the difference that we're talking about between an increase of 3.5% or an increase of 3% is basically uh, in how we will finance the purchase of a new ladder truck for the fire department. It's not whether we'll buy it or not, but it's how we'll finance it and whether we will keep the tax rate lower this year. Uh, uh, and spread the costs out over three years or whether we will uh, uh, try to pay for most of it up front this year. So that's the basic difference. There's no effect on the schools or the or community services. Thank you for the clarification. Any other um, <coughs> input before we vote? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Okay, the vote is five to one. Thank you very much. <coughs> now I would like to proceed to item number 145, which is to consider a report from the Finance Committee regarding the fiscal year 1993 sewer fund budget and take any necessary action. I will again defer to our uh, town Chair of the Finance Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to propose a motion that it be ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council acknowledge receipt of the Finance Committee report and set for public hearing on Monday, May 11, 1992 at 7.30 p.m. at Town Hall the proposed fiscal year 1993 sewer fund budget with expenditures of $1,359,785 
and revenues of $1,362,000. Second that motion. We have a motion and we have a second. Is there any discussion on item 145? All those in favor, please signify with your right hand. The vote is six to zero. Thank you very much. Item number 146 <coughs> is to consider a report from the Finance Committee regarding the fiscal year 1993 Riverside Cemetery Fund budget and take any necessary action. Again, Councillor McLaughlin, I'll forego all your titles there. <laughs> Thank you. Again, we <coughs> are going to be presenting a budget component that has the revenues higher than the expenditures, which is always a pleasant task. I would propose that we order the Cape Elizabeth Town Council to acknowledge receipt of the Finance Committee report and set for public hearing on Monday, May 11, 1992, 7.30 at the Town Hall, the proposed fiscal year 1993 Riverside Cemetery Fund budget with expenditures of $15,561 and revenues of $16,900. Second motion. Again, we have a motion on the table and a second. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor? None opposed. It's a six to zero vote. <coughs> Thank you very much. Item num number 147 is to consider a request from the Cape Elizabeth School Board to authorize an application for school construction assistance and take <coughs> any necessary action. At this time, I will call upon our superintendent, uh, Dr. Goldman, please. Uh, excuse me, uh, Councillor Amaro, you wanted to uh, say something. Yes, Mr. Chairman, before you begin discussion of this item, I would like to ask the council to that I be excused from any discussion or action on this item because I am associated with the agency that provides the assistance for school construction projects. Okay, as we all know, Councilor Amaro is the chairman of the State Board of Education uh, in her many roles and is asking for uh, leave of this item. Is there any objection to her request? No objections. Okay, thank you very much. We'll have you join us in a bit. <coughs> Dr. Goldman. Thank you. Um, be fine for you to stay as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, I was able to distribute the packet to you uh, earlier so that I hope everybody has had a chance to look at it. It is rather long and I do understand that you have many things to look at uh, and appreciate the opportunity to give at least uh, quick explanations. Um, essentially, uh, this is not something I can explain or summarize quickly for people just watching this process, but this is uh, another piece along the timeline of trying to find out if we are going to get any state help in the necessary renovation construction projects that face us for our elementary schools. The one in front of you is for a middle school project. Uh, it is uh, it actually we have already mailed the uh, basic materials, but we do need to send up the cover sheet. Uh, you'll notice that there's an April 15th deadline, and when I inquired from the people in the office how I was going to manage that, uh, they suggested that we send the body of it with the cover letter following this meeting, so um, we will do that. <coughs> um, the, in essence, that middle school project is mostly renovation. We have looked at a number of uh, possibilities, however, and the one that is discussed as uh, the genesis or the general nub of the issue would be some mostly renovation, but some new construction uh, and some uh, demolition of the part of the school um, that's now known as the D-Wing. However, whether that is actually the shape of the final concept design is not determined yet. It, that has to be determined as part of the ongoing process. Uh, we are required by the state process to put in place some kind of project to tell them what our needs are so they will be able to rate our needs as my cover letter explained. Therefore, your vote tonight really is not a vote of support for a specific design. 
it, it would be a vote of support for us going forward through this process. <coughs> uh, I'm sure that the state asks for town council review because they need to know whether a community is relatively together on, as to the need for a project. Uh, for instance, sometimes these things go forward with nothing more than need for a new building and then a lot of discussion of what the needs are. Um, in order to speed up the process, or at least to make it more explicit, we are also now required to put in the pre-application planning document. That's the pink packet. Much of that comes from the, uh, the report that you've already seen uh, in the fall from the school space study. So if it felt a little bit like deja vu, it's because that's when we did the bulk of the uh, planning. Uh, therefore, I would ask that you could take this opportunity to ask me any specific question. Uh, we certainly do appreciate your interest uh, and your support. We recognize there may be some questions as to whether or not uh, we are talking about the exact outline of a project that you would like, but I just want to emphasize this is really a general application. So I'm available for questions. Are there uh, any particular questions for our superintendent uh, at this uh, time with respect to the issue? <coughs> Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Connie, one question. In part of the submission, the statement is made that the building would be housed, would be sized to house current and projected enrollment grades five through eight. That's correct. What year are we projecting to here? The state would, would uh, a lot of that would be negotiated as to the exact number of square footage that would be allowed, including not only classrooms, but also the size of what are known as core facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, at this point, we would be looking at the highest number you see there, uh, the peak uh, enrollment, I think it's 97, but that is also part of the project. Okay, so if we, if I have to explain this to somebody, do I say we're for the projected enrollment to the year 2000 or projected enrollment to what year? We would certainly uh, be looking at something that would take us for the peak enrollment that we have at the present time. Um, and frankly, for a middle school building, a lot of this negotiation will be uh, how many special spaces, how large the special spaces will be, um, things of that nature, not necessarily the exact number of classrooms, although that does get to be part of it. Um, but it, th I would anticipate that we would be building for reasonable accommodation of the figures we have. We are now seeing our largest, bul our, the current bulge with the upcoming fall moves into the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. um, we thought first when we were beginning to get the screening enrollments for the upcoming kindergarten that maybe we were seeing a smaller <coughs> kindergarten. It appears now it's going to hold pretty steady at the figure that we've been seeing. Um, our classes for the last eight years are fluctuating between, we have one very small class, or we're calling it very small now, about 120, uh, between 120 and 160. Uh, next year's kindergarten looks like it will be somewhere in the 130 range. Okay. So that actually, uh, the good news is it's fairly steady. The bad news is it is, it, it is a steady increase. Okay. Another question that I need to have answered so I can help do some budgeting decisions <laughs> is when would we expect to be having to finance this from town funds? The, uh, actually, the state board would not vote on this until summer of 93 the July State Board meeting of 93. That would be the speediest possibility, and frankly, I wouldn't hold it out as a very large possibility. We are entering this process without having had any opportunity yet to have the state rate this project against all the other projects throughout the state. Uh, I should get a reasonable uh, feedback from that, some reasonable feedback from that process, I believe, by the fall, although they have recently increased the lead time between application and actual state vote uh, by a few months, and I'm not exactly sure how that's going to affect the, the timeline for the state response. But they do typically tell uh, superintendents 
um, before the State Board meeting in order to allow us to go into concept design so that we would then be uh, have a you know some sense of what we're getting into uh, as I've explained before this is certainly not a totally funded uh, totally state funded application the most we can hope for is some help and this application will make it clearer to us where we stand with some help the state does not particularly um, smile <coughs> on projects for renovation most renovation projects typically are locally funded the thing that makes this one, um, according to the people that I've consulted at the state level, at least worth our while to put in, is that we are talking about some additions and we are talking about um, major problems. And one of the things that they will be weighing is the cost effectiveness of renovation, new construction, et cetera. So if the state board votes favorably next summer, a year from this a coming year from summer, this summer right. a year from July or August. Mm -hmm. What is the next step in the progression financially? We would go to a local referendum uh, at a time set by uh, the council. Probably the typical practice is sometime in the fall, but it might be earlier. I mean, it might be, for instance, early in the fall rather than waiting for a national election. Or I'm not sure. No, that's that. 93 isn't an election year. At least it's not a. Well, whatever. <laughs> Stop and think about that for a minute. But typically, you try to fold those in together so that your referenda are not um, causing a, a you know a separate a voting. Uh, as far as <coughs> what happens then, uh, because this is a site already in use, we have to go to the DEP. I guess we go to the DEP anyway. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are uh, complications. I'm sure you know more about that than I do. Uh, certainly, I know enough to know that we would probably spend a good deal of time, months, probably before we could actually turn a shovel. It would be summer, I would guess, of 94 before we could start construction. Now, what typically happens, again, if you, once you have a referendum, it's a favorable referendum, you can go out for bond anticipation notes <coughs> to cover some of the necessary uh, application or, or planning costs. Um, but your major costs would begin um, presumably the summer of 94. Which would be our fiscal year 95. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there other questions for Mrs. Goldman? Councilor Jordan. Just, just one little comment, but in the meantime, to get to the 1994, you'll start planning and figuring and doing laying a little groundwork right off of what your needs might be so you can put it together at a later date or do you wait until after you hear from the state? Well I think uh, the concept design phase is going to cost us money. We have to hire an architect. We don't have the money to do that at the present time. We have however gone through some uh, through the, the one of the purposes of the planning we study was to give us a fairly good handle on what we can do and what we can't do. Um, so I would anticipate that we can build on that certainly for uh, public informational purposes. I think it's really important for, for us to reach out and talk to uh, groups of parents to let them know what the situation is. Um, and I'm sure there might be some other things along that nature that we can do that are not necessarily going to cost us a lot of money. But um, I would have to study the situation pretty carefully to see what we could plan to do uh, since we have not put in our current budget any funds for hiring an architect to do anything more than um, the needs that we've already identified as part of the budget process, which are mainly the move to the uh, high school. Okay, but I was just wondering is, and I guess you're thinking along that line is to uh, give out information let the people be aware of the projects coming down the road but it's not going to be done in two years from now it's going to be at least three if not four years well the one possibility uh, I don't know I would not even attempt to speculate on what kind of possibility is that we may get a feed we may get feedback from the state that puts us five to seven years down the line for any kind of help and we might find that that help would be a fairly small percentage of the total project cost. I think if we get some kind of news like that we really the school board needs to consider carefully whether we can wait five to seven years. Uh, that 
poses another whole set of issues. And at this point, I would prefer not to speculate on them because they are, um, you know, clearly expensive. Thank you. You're welcome. House of McLaughlin. Thank you. <coughs> Wheels keep turning here. How much state aid could we anticipate in the sunniest of circumstances? Well, the only st you get state aid commensurate with the degree of uh, subsidy. We are now at a 29% uh, degree of subsidy, so um, the state aid we get should be commensurate with that. However, there's another issue here. We are not talking about building a total new school. Uh, after examining the projected costs for that and the cost of renovations, this one, which we explained, I think, at the time, is a sort of uh, the best of the various compromises that we looked at. It would yield a good building, but it would also make maximum use of some of the facilities that we now have. Um, we will have to negotiate with the state to see how much of the cost of the total project, let's say it's a $6 million cost total project. Uh, tw you, you, you could start by figuring 29%. However, that $6 million would be some renovation, some new construction. How much of the renovation we would get 29% on is arguable. So we might end up getting 29% only of the new construction. And they right? also will do 29 or will do the subsidy amount <coughs> for renovation for uh, up to code work. I will be going through mm -hmm. the same similar process in the fall to put in an application for Pond Cove. Uh, that, however, is a smaller project and it's known as a special project because it will be focused on asking for 8,000 square feet or less, which is essentially an addition of a gymnasium space at Pond Cove. The application will also ask for uh, subsidy commensurate help for renovation for bringing certain parts of that building up to code. But there would be some local pieces too. See, these are the two kinds, actually there are three kinds of projects. The third one is uh, the replacement of portables. However, the replacement of portables does not work as well for us as it might for some towns because we are actually uh, using excess space we have at the high school um, to help in that. So again, again, the state process does look at the total square footage throughout the district. Uh, so the fact that we are now going to be making more use of the square footage we have at the high school will certainly help our application. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other uh, <clears throat> questions uh, for clarification? Well, I'm going to uh, <coughs> ask for a uh, motion at this time. Mr. Chairman. Councilor McLaughlin. I would like to move that we authorize the council to sign the application for the school construction assistance that's been presented to us this evening. Second my motion. Okay, I have a motion and I have a second. Is there any uh, discussion at this particular time? Before the vote, I would like to remind <coughs> my colleagues that uh, as per the revised rules of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, revised 12991, <coughs> section 8, as our group is uh, smaller and smaller here, uh, <coughs> every ordinance, order, and resolve shall require on final passage the affirmative vote of four members of the Town Council just for your uh, interest as I ask for uh, the vote at this particular time. All those in favor? Vote is five to nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and may I leave uh, the cover sheet <laughs> to you sign? Certainly. So that we may reveal that. And I also, uh, we did upgrade for some census figures, and I'll also be with the town clerk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Goldman. <coughs> okay. Item number 148 on the agenda tonight is to consider a report <coughs> from the Ordinance Committee regarding <coughs> shoreland zoning and modification of the wetland provisions of the zoning ordinance as well as to take any necessary action. And at this time, I will defer to the chair of the, actually I'll defer to the
temporary chair, chair of the Ordinance Committee this evening, uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The members of the Ordinance Committee are Phyllis Cogeshall, who is the chairman, Councillor Jordan, and myself. And we have done <coughs> a bit of work, as you're all aware, on the wetlands <coughs> ordinance and what it has grown into, the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. Just to recap for everybody's benefit some history of this, recent history, we brought this, the Shoreland Zoning Amendments, to the Council for public hearing on December 9, 1991. At that time, the public hearing was tabled. The Town Council held a workshop on July, on July, don't I wish, June, Ju how about January 9th? <laughs> I'm going to get into summer. You were there, Carl, right? It was January, January 9th, 1992. We then had a continuation of the public hearing on January 13th, 1992. At that time, there was a council vote to send the amendments back to the Ordinance Committee. The council gave specific direction for the Ordinance Committee to consider amendments that impacted coastal sand dunes to ask residents to prepare specific proposals for ordinance amendments, to look at a physical constructed additions to existing properties, whether or not the ordinance language was over restrictive concerning that type of construction, and to look at the question, should wetlands that have been filled be treated differently? The ordinance committee proceeded to meet in four sessions, some of which other counselors did attend. Those meetings are January 23rd, February 24th, March 19th, and April 1st. In the course of the work of the Ordinance Committee, we have retained to a very large extent the existing policies that form the premise and basis for our existing wetland <coughs> ordinance. That is the ordinance that went into effect in May of 1990. At that time, as we do with all ordinance work, we were looking at keeping the balance between putting restrictions on people's properties and the need to protect the sensitive natural areas in our town, those being our wetlands. As we have worked through additional amendments, we have tried diligently to keep that balance in mind. It has become an evolving ordinance and I'm not going to in any way pretend that what we are going to present right now is the final chapter in this language. There was consensus on the ordinance committee that we bring this back to the council at this time with the hope we could set it to public hearing and bring the the current chapter to a close and meet a state deadline. As I said, we did not change policies in the existing wetlands ordinance. When we created that ordinance, we went, we tried to accommodate local conditions, local situations. We created two wetland zones, acknowledging the difference between different extents and types of wetlands, as you, Mr. Chairman, are well aware through the many drafts we had with that ordinance. Some of the major policies as outlined in the cover letter to the Council this evening were that we would not allow filling of critical wetlands, that there would be less protection for less sensitive wetland protection areas. In fact, we allowed then and continue to allow limited filling with a permit from the planning board for some of those areas. There's been some concern about the buffer areas for our wetlands. I do want to remind the council that the policies that led to the creation of these buffer areas and their inclusion in the current ordinance state date back at least to 1987 when there was a recommendation from the Conservation Commission 
that buffers be established as protection for the wetlands. We have done, we have lessened the restrictions on within some of the buffer zones, but we have not done away with the buffer zones at this point. The second page of the cover letter to the council gives an, an outline <coughs> of the changes we are presenting at this point. And I would like to review those both for the council's benefit and for the public's benefit. The first one mentioned and the last one mentioned both deal with the inverse setback provision. You should have at your place this evening a letter from Michael Hill, one of our town attorneys, concerning the inverse setback provision. We also did have correspondence from a citizen concerned about the um, where we had that language within the ordinance. And that citizen was on target in pointing out to us that it was not probably in the correct section of the ordinance. We do agree with that. I would propose that in, actually instead of what was before you in the packet that we go along with what Michael Hill wrote to us and his recommendation is that we put the inverse setback provision into the wetlands non-conforming section. Keep it as part of the wetlands because that's where we use it and that would put it into section 19 dash 3 dash 9 dash 12 sub f which is on page 33 it was on, it's included in mr hill's letter to us that we received this evening i think it's very appropriate again that we have that inverse setback provision in which deals with non-conforming residential structures and have it in the non-conforming section of the wetlands section. Therefore, it's very appropriate also to take it out of the non-conforming non-residential structure area where it exists right now. That's a nice correction we're able to make at this time. Examples of us, there are a number of examples where we have lightened up on the restrictions in the existing wetlands ordinance and I think this has been in response to concerns brought forward by the public. Some of it in response to specific concerns that were submitted to us in writing. One of these concerns was my house is on filled land where maybe probably it used to be a wetland. How can you still call that, pro that land where my house is a wetland? Thought, all right, we will try to deal a bit better with the reality of the situation and come up with a provision that deals with that. What we came up with was a statement that filled land within 50 feet of a principal structure is not a wetland. This does not allow construction where it currently is not allowed. We have not changed that policy. It does not increase the buildability of lots in critical wetland buffers. <coughs> what it does do is it allows homeowners to legally refer to the area around their house as filled land rather than it's the current legal status of calling it a wetland. This is important to people who are <coughs> going through the process of trying to sell their house and this is the information they can legally put on their real estate card that it's on filled land rather than calling it a wetland. It also makes it possible for a person to get a building permit on filled land adjacent <coughs> to the wetland protection zone without going through the special permit um, from the planning board. So we believe we have reduced the restrictions in those instances. The third reference in the listing puts this into the special permit procedures and explains that you don't have to that if you do have to go through a special permit for any, because you're not a wetland protection zone, but in a different buffer area, that you may refer to that area around your home as filled <coughs> land instead of wetland. We did reduce the buffers in two instances, one for sand dunes down to 
100 feet. The buffer around a sand dune was reduced to 100 feet, and the buffers around wetlands that are two acres or less was also reduced to 100 feet. Again, trying to be more realistic and lightening up some of the restrictions. We also looked at buffer requirements as they related to tool sheds and as they related to decks. These were specifically in response to concerns brought forward to us by citizens. For tool sheds, we reduced the buffer to 100 feet and gave a size for tool sheds so that they would not be overly large and become garages. And the language is that the wetland buffer may re be reduced to 100 feet from the edge of the wetland to allow the placement of a permanent or temporary tool shed where the footprint of the tool shed does not exceed 80 square feet and the tool shed shall be, will be used for storage. That kind of tool shed will also require a building permit. And then for decks, the buffer reduction was to 75 feet with the understanding that the size of the deck would not exceed 25% of the total square footage of the dwelling footprint before the addition of the deck, that the surface of the deck would be permeable and the area underneath the deck would be covered with mulch, gravel, or some other type of pervious material. We wanted to maintain the pervious nature of the land at that point. It also states that the area underneath the deck shall not be paved or used for storage and such decks would require a building permit. So those are two additional instances in where, which we felt we were lightening up on the restrictions and <coughs> helping the citizens who had concerns in those areas. As I said, this is not the final chapter. I know there are still citizens with some strong concerns. We would like very much to be able to have a document that we can send to the state and then regroup and address the outstanding citizen concerns. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Councillor McLaughlin. Um, at this time, what I will ask for um, is any uh, public feedback and give anyone in the audience an opportunity to comment on the uh, <clears throat> issues that Councillor McLaughlin has discussed. And uh, then I'm going to put our <coughs> town planner on hold for a second and have her uh, perhaps respond as a <coughs> final uh, note if uh, there are concerns that need to be addressed uh, as well as to help anybody on the council that uh, has a need for clarification. Did you want to say something right now? Yes, sir. I'm sure. sorry. I did forget one additional correction that Mike Hill suggests that we make that I believe is very sensible. It's to change the deadline for registering ponds from last month until September 30, 1992. That change would be made on page 33. I just, we've passed the language that was in the draft. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members of the public. Mr. Roberts, please come down. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Town Council. My name is Jack Roberts and I'm the chairman of the Conservation Commission. I don't have any specific concerns that I wanted to relay to you this evening other than to state that Cape Elizabeth has taken a leadership role in the preservation of the wetlands and we do need to have something on the books and I'm hoping that you would not uh, back up and take that off and then have the, the town straddled with the state version of wetland protection whereby it's not tailored to the town's needs uh, I agree that there are some uh, problems that need to be addressed, but these can be addressed at a later date uh, on a situation by situation basis. And that, that, those are my comments. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. Appreciate those comments. Others who would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, I'll <coughs> bring the issue back to the uh, council. Fellow councilors, are there, uh, is there need at this particular time for clarification uh, with regard to the issue of simply setting this motion uh, 
to public hearing for our May 11th council meeting. So moved. We have second. a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Vote is 6 0. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilor McLaughlin, for doing a complicated job in the uh, absence of our <coughs> regular chair of our ordinance committee. Okay, at this particular time, we proceed to item 149, and this is to consider authorizing a grant application to the Casco Bay Estuary Project and take any necessary action. At this point, I will ask the Cape Elizabeth representative to the Casco Bay Estuary Project, Councillor Pearson, to update us on this item. Thank you, uh, Councillor Creelman. <clears throat> About February of, of, and excuse my voice, I'm not trying to disguise my voice here, I'm trying to get rid of the cold. Uh, last, uh, this past February, we received an application uh, from the Casco Bay Estuary uh, Project for many grants that are now being uh, given out by the project. Uh, the Casco Bay Estuary, for a quick uh, background of that, is uh, involves approximately 29 communities that all share the watershed that drains into the Casco Bay Estuary. Uh, it's about a five-year project that is uh, spearheaded by the EPA, the DEP, and other organizations, as well as local boards, commissions, and uh, lay people. And uh, it's an ambitious project and one that's, that's getting quite a bit of uh, getting its, its act together, if you will, and uh, now they're getting into the major thrust of it. Anyways, um, the uh, Cape, Elizabeth, uh, Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission, under the leadership of Jack Roberts, did submit an application to the estuary project. Uh, it has been received, uh, as well as 10 other communities, and it's going to be reviewed next week uh, this is the first step in the process. Uh, those applications or applicants that do proceed on that will be uh, potential recipients of matching grants. Uh, the particular one that, that uh, the Conservation Commission is shooting for uh, is part of the Greenbelt Plan um, as described in the Comprehensive Plan and uh, would provide a very uh, good recreational as well as educational facility for uh, the residents of Cape Elizabeth <coughs> and the, uh, the school, uh, I won't say children, school inhabitants, if you will. Uh, <coughs> and I'd like to, you know, suggest that we recommend this definitely to be uh, submitted for approval with our wholehearted uh, backing. And I think that our, our chances with the presentation that, that Jack Roberts has uh, put together with the help of the town manager and especially with Maureen McGovern, I mean Maureen O'Mara, excuse me. <laughs> She's the singer. <laughs> She's the singer. Okay. Uh, anyways, for, for Maureen O'Mara's the town planner's exquisite language in the, uh, the putting together of this grant application and uh, without further ado and with my cold hair getting away, I will stop. Thank you very much. Okay, barring any more Freudian slips here, uh, let me ask if there are any input from my fellow counselors. <laughs> Councilor Amaro. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move approval of uh, this grant application. I'll second that. Okay, there is a motion for approval and a second. Is there further discussion? Councilor Jordan. I'm in agreement as far as the application, what have you, but there's a part that bothers me within this application is the Spurlink Marsh Link, the Greenbelt. Now, the town don't really own that Spurlink Marsh as of now, and there's other community fields, they have a little ownership too, and I can interpret this that we're going ahead to and <coughs> set up uh, trails and what have you with the, within the, <coughs> along the edge of the Spunk Marsh. And I don't feel that's right 
at this point. I agree with the rest of it until you get to your ownership. And I know I've been told two or three times that that is going that way, but if I want to read this application correctly, I can find it in it. Well, I'm going to ask, or, okay. Oh, excuse me. Surely. Uh, Chairman Groom. Uh, Council Jordan, just, just for clarification, that this has been changed since the original due to that uh, discussion that we had at the neighborhood meeting. And I believe, and Jack could probably come up and, and address this, or Maureen, uh, but this isn't involving that part of the Sperwink Marsh uh, contiguous with the land in question. This is uh, from uh, the Cape Elizabeth High School, a long town owned land, I believe, behind the Elizabeth Park area and also the proposed Atlantic uh, House, Atlantic House? Atlantic uh, Corporation uh, development and linking up with the Willow Brook easement, which I believe is in land trust and our Conservation Commission ownership. So it doesn't touch any of the lands that are in question with uh, what you were referring to. And uh, I don't know if that clarifies it, uh, but it would essentially, and maybe Jack could uh, back this up, it's going from the Willow Brook where it meets with Scott Dyer Road and follows a trail network back to the high school. The trail would go from behind the high school along the uh, sewer easement that heads down towards uh, <coughs> Sperling Avenue and along kind of parallel with Scott Dyer. And the actual signs and identification of the wetland area is on the land that is currently owned by the land trust. So we are going to be doing this in a uh, cooperative venture with them, with the town putting up $250 through the Conservation Commission's budget and the land trust putting an additional 250 in to be partners in this project with us. Is that? I have, I have no pro problems with your project. I just have problems with it. Project description, develop pedestrian trail along the cable is a portion of the Spurling Marsh. The Do you own that Spurling Marsh that that project is going to touch? Doesn't, doesn't the marsh go all the way to the high school? Yes. Do you own it? No. I, okay. I well, you're speaking of it. This, this is all within the Spurling Marsh that another community feel that they have a say in it. And I say that it is wrong to feel that you own it and continue along. Because the, where the transfer station, that all comes down and there's a piece there that the town owned that was given to us by the spray. And then as you go around in back of that piece, as Adaya owns that, do you own it yet? We're over, Billy, we're on the other side by the, uh, up behind the Viking nursing home. By the Viking nursing home. Do, does a town own that section of it? We have a, an easement, the Conservation Commission has an easement down from Scott Dyer Road. The land trust owns the land that we're talking about putting the, uh, the project on. Well, I guess I don't un understand where the marsh is that you're talking about, but that is I like to know when you got the marsh, ownership right behind, of it. Right all the way up behind the high school, um, from the, the church or down to Higgins Beach is all part of the Sperling Marsh. We had originally planned to do it further up along the contested land, but that's not part of the project now. Well, I think that you might find that that section is part of the contested land before you get done. And this is a part that bothers me. You're moving ahead and you're telling these other people, we don't care what you have to say, we're going to move ahead and set up our trails. If you put a, something in a document like this, and I think it's the wrong way of doing it. I don't believe we're near, anywhere near the contested land. Okay. Uh, let me ask the town manager to help out in a <clears throat> little bit of clarification here. Yeah. I, I think you know it is absolutely important that it be clear that none of this is going on any of the land uh, owned by Thomas Jordan. If, if you want to put that as a condition of the approval, uh, that would be fine because there, there is absolutely no intent to uh, have it at all uh, involved in any of the Thomas Jordan land. I understand that there's no intent of doing it. I, my point is you're giving somebody else some ammunition that you're not paying attention to what they have to say, so you're just going to move forward, and I think it's in there. I think what, what I'm trying to say is I don't want to give anyone am, any ammunition, and if you're concerned about that, it, it, it might reduce the potential for ammunition uh, if it's made clear as part of the motion. 
Well, I think something should be in there. Perhaps there all, it also could be made clear with another statement within the application form somehow. But this, this land is all either conservation easements to the town and or land owned or conservation easements to the land trust. That's in the grant actually, that it's oh, on the land there. trust land. Is there something that says that all the, I think just another paragraph put onto this, an addendum onto this, <coughs> that kind of information may ease Councillor Jordan's concern, which I would also, I, yeah, reading just Spurwink Marsh link and somebody not looking at this real carefully and not taking the time to pick out the distinctions may not serve us well in the future. Part of the reason for using the Spurwink Marsh as the title was the fact that right. it's a Casco Bay estuary project and we wanted to show the link with that. But certainly we can add anything to an addendum to it. Councilor Jordan, are you are you comfortable with the idea of uh, an addendum or a disclaimer or something that would be an additional statement, um, making it very clear that because the uh, ownership of the the Thomas Jordan land is um, in question as of this date, that we are not presuming that we own the Thomas Jordan land. Uh, at all, and that this particular proposal, uh, which would be for the grant from the estuary project, would not involve any of that land that is in dispute. I think something like that should be in there if you want to move forward with, the, with this project. And that clarifies it for anybody that's speaking of the Spunk Marsh, and this is what this speaks of, is a Spunk Marsh, period. I think you've got to narrow it down so if there is a section, which there is a section in question, that it should be spelled out. Uh, I don't know. Somebody can put a paragraph together real quick. I'll go along. Jack, I'll you're... I can table it until a later date. <clears throat> Jack, your explanation to us of exactly where the trails would be, where is this located, the, the exact uh, geographical area? It is directly behind the Viking nursing home. Uh, I'm sorry, I understood that. I meant where is it exactly on paper? On paper? Um, it's, it's underneath um, where on the first page. Okay. On the name of project, you're down to where. And just that the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust owns land in the marsh where our system trails could be strate strategically located and marked along the wetland upland edge. Uh, and then it also refers to the uh, linkage with the high school and one at Bill <coughs> Rodman, one of our members is currently working with the uh, public water district to get a, an actual pedestrian easement across that as well and has told me that there should be no problem with that. But now what you're telling us is you're kind of reading between the lines from what it actually says on the paper. You're expanding because you have the specific knowledge of exactly where you're talking about. That is not on the paper. That's, that perhaps is the problem Councillor Jordan has, and I have to agree with him. It, it, on paper, it does look a little bit vague. I would need to get back to the land trust to get more specifics on the boundaries of that, piece, that parcel of land to, before I could put them on paper. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that, I think we could say something that, <clears throat> to the effect of what you previously had stated, Mr. Chairman, that none of the land being proposed for trails at this time is part of the Jordan Trust property as we understand it. And I'm comfortable with that uh, and I'm prepared to vote for it in the affirmative. I, I just want to make it crystal clear that, that this uh, application would not be Exhibit A uh, yeah. right. <laughs> in litigation yeah. if, uh, you know, our neighboring uh, South Portland decided to, to push this issue into that court. So that's, that's my concern, that we want to be crystal clear about the specifics of the land. Um, so, and, and is there a need to vote on it tonight from the point of view of uh, being in the running um, and actually being able to accept the money? 
Apparently there is, if you want it. I'm sorry? I have a paragraph if you want it. Okay, Michael uh, is just about <clears throat> putting the final touch, Councillor Jordan, if we all will listen very clearly to his, his paragraph and see if this would be acceptable. Yeah, funds utilized as a part of this project may be utilized, I've used the word twice, only on land owned in fee simple by the town of Cape Elizabeth or the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust or on land over which there are specific easements allowing a public right of access. The town council specifically prohibits the use of these funds on any land owned in trust for the poor of the, of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Does that satisfy your concern? Maybe I shouldn't even vote on, uh, vote on it because it, you could trail it back to my ancestors if you want to go back years enough, but I'll vote on it. I feel comfortable with it. Thank you, Counselor. Um, I, I've forgotten whether we have a motion at this time. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would move that we amend the current motion with the language just presented by the manager. We have a... I'll second it. Second, okay. We have a second on the amendment. Uh, is there discussion on the amendment? I believe it would be appropriate to uh, vote at this particular time on an amendment. All those in favor? Okay, the vote is, it both is six to zero on the amendment. Okay. Now for the larger motion, there is a motion on the table and a second. Is there further discussion on the main motion? Okay, all those in favor of the main motion? The vote is six to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. <coughs> okay, uh, item number 150 is to consider authorizing an application for a small business administration tree planting program grant and take any necessary action. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Yes, our tree warden Rick Churchill has prepared an application to the Small Business Administration uh, for the planting of trees. Specifically, uh, there would be 25 trees planted throughout the town of Cape Elizabeth. They would be a varied species. The total project cost is $10,060.60. One half of this would be funded by the SBA. Uh, the remainder, non-federal local share of $5,030.30 would be funded as follows, $750 as, as an in-kind contribution of, of one-fourth of the tree warden's stipend for the year. Uh, excuse to it, no, let me take that. <coughs> that includes uh, part of the tree warden's stipend as well as uh, some public works. Uh, some public works personnel, 2% of a person of public works. Also, $2,031.70 would be solicited from citizen groups. Uh, I think the, the specific change in this uh, would be that it would fund the replacement of trees. Uh, we haven't been uh, doing that a whole lot lately. We've been mostly spending all our tree funds on removals. Uh, it would allow uh, trees to be uh, placed on private property as a part of the program, and you will have a, an issue later on the agenda to deciding specifically uh, if you wish to do that as a policy. And I, I think the other unique thing uh, about this particular grant is that it, it would uh, have a great deal of citizen involvement, hopefully some of the garden clubs, the schools, and other professional groups in, in not only participating in the funding, but also participating, uh, perhaps assisting with the planting as well. So I would uh, request that you authorize the submittal of the grant application. I move we authorize it. Second. Have a <coughs> we have a motion and a second. Any uh, discussion on this, Councilor Jordan? I would just <coughs> like to ask the manager a question of, is uh, Gladys Brown fund all been spent that no. you left with trees? Could, that couldn't be used for this, tree planting? Some of it could be. Some of it could be. You needed to. Okay. Uh, it's a small project, but it's a thick document. It's one of my only comments. Federal government's involved. I hate to have a big project. <laughs> <laughs> How many trees? Further, dis many trees? further discussion on this uh, motion. All those in favor? Vote is six to zero. Thank you. 
Item number 151 this evening is to consider the acceptance <coughs> of various state grants and appropriations and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern. Yes, each year uh, the, the state requires that the town council and municipal offices specifically vote to accept all the different categories of state funds. On the item before you, there's a, there's a listing on the opposite side that lists those state funds, everything from municipal revenue sharing, state aid to education, road money, library per capita, snowmobile registration money, tree growth reimbursement, general assistance reimbursement, veterans exemption, and then anything else that they want to send us. Uh, so uh, I vote for that. I would uh, <laughs> hope that, that you would you would sign this uh, <coughs> indicating that uh, you wish the funds to be accepted. So moved. Second it. Any discussion? All those in favor? Vote is six to zero. Thank you. <coughs> Item one <coughs> fifty two this evening is to consider declaring that a portion of future expenditures for school construction, high school improvements, a school bus, and a ladder truck may be reimbursed from future bond and note proceeds and take any, any necessary action, Mr. McGovern. Yes, the United States Treasury uh, issued some new rules uh, that became effective on March 2nd, 1992, indicating that if, if you're going to be doing a bond issue in the future, that you couldn't put any expense into that bond issue or capitalize any expense unless before you had spent those funds you had indicated that, the, that they might be part of a bond issue or a note. Uh, I'm not too sure there are all the exact reasons for doing this, um, uh, but it's the United States Treasurer would like uh, you to do this. Uh, specifically in the budget early this evening you voted for, uh, to go ahead with the school construction grant application, not, not necessarily a project. Uh, you have in the the school budget that's before that will be before you at a public hearing next month some improvements uh, you have a school bus uh, that some improvements at the high school you have a school bus as well and a ladder truck some of which may be bonds and some of which may be notes so I would would ask in in conformance uh, with this new regulation that you declare that a portion of future expenditures for those items may be reimbursed for future bond and note proceeds and that you uh, I ask that this be made available for public inspection. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Vote is six to zero. Thank you. Item number 153 is to consider <coughs> a proposed sexual harassment policy and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern. Yes, last month you had this on your, your agenda and I wasn't here and there was a question of whether or not it had been reviewed by the town attorney. We did have one before you last month that had been reviewed uh, by an attorney uh, other than the town attorney and other than MMA. You specifically voted at your meeting last month to have it reviewed by MMA or by, by the town attorney. Uh, that was done. Uh, he made a few minor changes. Uh, <coughs> I would encourage you to adopt this so that it will be in conformance with the state statute requiring such a policy. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Is there uh, further discussion on the sexual harassment policy? And I'm referring to the one that clearly uh, was indicated as our second one by uh, our legal counsel, Mr. Leahy. Any discussion? Councilor Amaro. No, just a question about uh, was the other uh, counsel that was consulted uh, someone not on the town's payroll, or where, where did the advice come from? It came from, uh, I was at a, at a workshop on a totally unrelated issue. I think it was cable TV, and I mentioned to an attorney there that uh, we were looking at uh, sexual harassment, and it showed up two days later in the mail unsolicited. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other <coughs> need for clarification on the... Uh, proposed policy we have before us. All those in favor? The vote is six to zero. Thank you. Item number 154 this evening is to consider approving the acceptance of tree planting easements and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern. Yes. Uh, earlier this evening, a few minutes ago, you voted 
uh, two <coughs> for, for a grant that would allow uh, some planting of trees on private property, specifically uh, a private property within 25 feet of the street right of way, and that uh, it would also have to be in, in a particular location that could be viewed uh, by the public. You know, in other words, it really wouldn't be in a backyard. Uh, the town attorney has reviewed the, the language of the easement and by facts today has indicated his approval of, of the language. Uh, we, we would not be responsible for maintenance of the trees after planting. Uh, when I first reviewed this issue with the tree warden uh, a couple of months ago now, uh, I had indicated to him that uh, I didn't think it was something that the town would want to have long-term responsibility for, uh, the planting of every tree on, on private property that the town had been involved in the original planting. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, Councillor McLaughlin also called me today to ask if the town would have any liability in this. And, I responded as I often do that the town has liability in everything that it does does do so uh, we would have some liability okay do I have a motion on this uh, item? Move acceptance. second it. A motion on the second uh, council Jordan so if you set out one tree on private property and they don't properly take care of it and it passes away do you <coughs> get another one Part of the agreement would be no. So they'd be interviewed pretty thoroughly that they're going to take care of this tree before you allow it to go there. Is that correct? I don't know if interview is the proper term. <laughs> I think the tree warden <laughs> would have quite a discussion with them, yes. Rick, is, Rick Churchill is very serious about trees. And, uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll get a, a, a letter once it's planted informing them of, of care and maintenance. And, encouraging uh, the same. Are you suggesting a uh, psychological profile on potential owners? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I can s understand some people getting something free and not taking care of it, and I've seen it happen before, that's all. Mm, I think we need to clarify that people would not be getting it free. It's my understanding from our discussion this afternoon that the property owner could purchase through the, the trees we hope to be able to get through that small business grant would be entitled to purchase a tree at a reduced price, but it would not be free. <coughs> and that the town would be responsible for the planting of the tree. Thank you. I didn't quite read it that way, but maybe you dropped it that way. That's why I make my phone call. Okay. Is that I, I'm just going by the information I from it. Councilor McLaughlin is uh, accurate, as usual. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion on this item? All those in favor? The vote is uh, with uh, Councillor Chapel. Is the vote six to zero? Yes. It is six to zero. <coughs> Thank you very much. Item 155 this evening. <coughs> Excuse me. A little bit of a cough here. To consider approving the warrant for the May 5th, 1992 municipal election and take any necessary action. Uh, I will defer to uh, Ms. Pizzo on this item. Thank you. You should have received <coughs> in your packet a copy of the warrant that does call for the municipal election to be held at the high school on Tuesday, May 5th. They'll be voting for two members of the council, two members of the school board, both, both for three-year terms. The polls open at 7 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. A new state law would allow us to vote the absentee ballots after 2 p.m. on election day. For those folks that need to register to vote, you can either do that at the town hall during business hours or on Thursday, April 30th from 7 to 9 p.m. The Board of Voter Registration will be here at town hall. And also late this afternoon, I did receive the absentee ballot so that anyone who is not going to be present for election day on Tuesday, May 5th can come into the town hall and vote absentee. And I would um, request that you authorize the signing of this one. So moved. Any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Vote to six zero. Thank you. Item, <coughs> item number 156 is to consider the appointment of election clerks and take any necessary action. Again, Ms. Pizzo. Thank you. The election laws uh, require that the municipal officers appoint election clerks each general election year. We have received um, names from both the Democratic and the Republican town committees. 
I would recommend that you appoint these election clerks and also to clarify that if any of these folks are not able to serve as election clerks, the, do the law does allow us to go beyond these and to get election clerks so that we have the appropriate personnel on election day. So move, Mr. Chairman. Second. Ms. Pizzo, would it be appropriate as a consequence of these individuals offering their time to just read who they are? Sure, I'd be happy public? to. The Democratic uh, Town Committee recommends Marv Chaikin, Francis Chaikin, Fran Stone, Tom Summers, Eleanor Hines, Helen Damon, and Karen Dunphy. The Republican Town Committee would recommend Barbara Adams, Joan Barker, Colleen Hall, Jane Harley, Don Lunny, Virginia Shafter, Norman Spratt, and Evelyn Strong. Thank you very much. There is a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Six to zero. Thank you. Item number 157 this evening is to consider authorizing a quit claim deed to H. Baldwin and Nina Carter Hoffman for land and building on Elmwood Road on the map U3-21 and take any necessary action. Ms. Pizzo. Thank you. The town did foreclose on this property for an unpaid sewer lien on December 9th, 1991. I have received a check, a bank check from the Baldwins to cover both the sewer and taxes. It would pay everything through June 30th, 1992. I would recommend that you authorize the town manager to sign the quick claim. So moved. Second. Ms. Piso, I always enjoy seeing a Xerox of the check. How much was this check in uh, the amount of. Do you have that offhand? Uh, uh, I had it. It was, just, it was over $900. Just over over $900. $900. Okay. Okay. There is a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of acceptance? Vote is 6 to 0. Thank you again. <coughs> Item 158 to consider establishing burial fees for Riverside Cemetery and take any necessary action. And uh, again, I would just indicate that this is simply to consider establishing the fees. This has nothing to do with who is going to be digging, uh, just for people's uh, interest. Uh, and I will again defer to our town clerk, Ms. Pizzo. Thank you. The town recently requested proposals for uh, burial fees at Riverside. We are looking at the 1992, 93, and 94 burial seasons. I would recommend that you authorize the following fees. Uh, regular adult burial weekday, 165. Adult burial Saturdays and holidays, 190. Infant burial weekday, Saturdays and holidays, 65. Cremain burial weekday, 75. Cremain burial Saturdays and holidays, $90. Do I have a motion? Yeah. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, is there discussion on the burial fees? All those in favor of Councilor Jordan. I'm just going to ask what the, incre what the increase was. The, oh, I'm sorry, the increase between the bid and what I'm recommending are for administrative fees of the town um, traditionally. There's no increase from a year ago. Was it last year? Over last the, year? The um, burial weekday last year was 150 So it's gone up $15. Right. We did. The next one, you know, right off hand? One seventy-five. It's about fifteen dollars yeah. for each. And this is good until nineteen ninety-four. That's right for three seasons. Three seasons. I like the way you put that. <laughs> Councilor Jordan, did you want to make any point about the fact I, that the I'll fees no, are increasing? No, those people <laughs> don't cause any problem. They rest very peacefully. I'll have no more to say. Ready to vote. Okay, we do have a motion and a second. Are there uh, further discussion? Voting for the new fees, we have a six to zero vote. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Item num number 159 tonight is to consider the report from the appointments committee regarding appointments to the recycling committee <coughs> and family fund day committee and take any necessary action. Now I will defer to the chair of our appointments committee, uh, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chairman Croman. <coughs> right now we have uh, two actually three vacancies in, in Council Chapel uh, give the third nomination which was delivered late uh, hot off the press um, but we'd like to recommend from the appointments committee that Joanne Daigle fill the uh, vacated spot of EJ Silk who has done a fantastic job at the Main Street 90 uh, subcommittee on, on recycling and is also 
been a committed uh, volunteer with the Recycling Committee, and we, we wish her well and thank her for her time. Uh, Joanne Daigle to, to fill her spot, and Fred Jansen to serve on the Family Fun Day Committee. And uh, Councillor Chapel also has a second recommendation to the Family Fun Day Committee. Yeah, already? Yes, sir, okay. please. The uh, late appointment that came in that we'd like to have you approved is Angela Pearson to the Family Fund Day Committee. And, and as a final note, if I could, uh, we have one position left open on the Arts Commission due to a resignation. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank uh, Verna Andrews for her, her time on the Commission and uh, appreciate her, her uh, help. Um, so if anyone out there uh, wants to join the Arts Commission, please stop by the Town Hall and just an, as an aside to that, if you find a committee that you might like to be on at any time during the year, please stop by and see the town clerk and at least make your interest be known because we occasionally do have resignations in the middle of the uh, stream of things and we'd like to keep that stream flowing. So thank you very much for your interest. Thank you very much, Councillor Pearson. <clears throat> do we have a motion for these new additions to our boards? So moved. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? 6-0 vote. Thank you very much. And, and again, thank you to all of the citizens who continue to, to be those thousand points of light out there on our boards and commissions. At this point, I would ask the, the council to suspend the rules so that we can take an item that was not on the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much. This would be item number 160 tonight, <coughs> and it is the annual FIDO warrant, <laughs> the municipal warrant for prosecuting unlicensed dog owners dash keepers. Uh, I will defer at this time to Ms. Pizzo. Thank you very much. I do apologize for the tardiness of this. The state never sent us a warrant this year, and as I was preparing for tonight's agenda, it hit me that it was April and we start the late fees May 1st. So it is the annual warrant that basically allows us to charge a $6 late fee and we do begin that on May 1st for all unlicensed dogs. And we do encourage you to authorize signing of the warrant. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you very much. Again, a 6-0 vote. Okay, at this time, we have an opportunity to ask uh, for citizen discussion of items not on the agenda. Uh, is there anyone uh, present who cares, cares to uh, discuss any item of interest to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth this evening? Seeing none, we will uh, proceed to the final item then, which is uh, adjournment. I think we adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I second it. There is a motion for adjournment and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you very much. 6 0 vote. Good night, uh, citizens of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you for tuning in. Thank <laughs> you.